Um, the end of that movie always makes me cry. I've seen it a few times. <laughs> so, but now for the fun part. Um, now that you've seen that movie, you can guess at what a joy and honor it is for me to introduce Sam Smith, Samantha Berg, John Jett, and Jeff Becky. Um, <clears throat> I got to know them on the social media via my reporting on these related issues. And then our family had the chance to meet them in person when people from all over the country came to San Juan Island this past summer to talk about killer whales. And then to encounter them in the wild. They're here with us tonight because of that wonderful gathering, and I'm so very, very grateful that you all came here. So first off, I'm going to introduce each of these folks. Then I'll ask each one of them to take about two minutes to share why they're here and what drives them to do what they're doing. And then we'll open up the floor for questions. So Jeff Ventry is a medical doctor now, licensed in the state of Washington, and is a board certified specialist in the area of physical medicine and rehabilitation. He treats patients with disabilities ranging from spinal cord and brain injury to low back pain, carpal tunnel syndrome, and amputations. He's also a doctor of chiropractic, and continues to use spinal manipulation as a complementary therapy in his medical practice. Jeff was a marine mammal trainer at SeaWorld from 1987 to 1995. He worked with John Jett, Samantha Bird, and Carol Ray at SeaWorld in Orlando. The four ex-trainers continue to spread the word regarding cetacean captivity as a group known as Voice of the Orcas. And John Jett is a visiting research professor at Stetson University in Gilead, the land, Florida. Dr. Jett has both a professional and educational background in the environmental sciences, which includes an ongoing investigation of marine mammal conservation in Florida and elsewhere. As an ARCA trainer at SeaWorld of Florida from 1992 to 1996, Dr. Jett quickly realized that most of the captive orcas he worked with were burdened with health and behavioral challenges as a direct result of their confinement. He came to fully appreciate the unfair nature of captivity when he first saw wild orcas in the Pacific Northwest, which he considers a seminal point in his life. Since that time, he has engaged in evidence-based writing and speaking on the consequences of keeping orcas in captivity for entertainment purposes. And Samantha Bird is awesome. <laughs> Well, I can tell you, I can tell you that I know that Samantha, Samantha um, got an amazing degree in animal science at Cornell University, and went on. She wanted to do veterinary science, is that right? But decided to take um, some time to do something fun first, which led to the job at SeaWorld, is that right? Yes. And now she is an amazing acupuncturist in Alaska. All right, well, thank you, Rachel and Chris and Moscow for having us. Um, this whole event really originated probably back in the late 1980s and early 1990s when uh, John and I and others began to realize what we were engaged in in SeaWorld was, was wrong. And um, in 1999, when Daniel Dukes was killed, I was in New York at the time, and I got a call from John. And he goes, what are we going to do about it? And unfortunately, Daniel Dukes was killed, and no one saw it. And so SeaWorld got to say whatever they wanted to say. The same thing happened again in uh, 2010, on February, uh, February 24th. Um, Dawn was killed, and this time, Howard Garrett, a guy in the film, uh, happened to uh, uh, send CNN my way. Um, Anderson Cooper called me and said, will you be on our show? And I didn't feel comfortable getting involved. And, and John called and said, hey man, it's, it's our obligation to insert ourselves into the conversation. And so that interview and, and John was interviewed by CNN as well, and it kind of snowballed a little bit. And we became like the only two people that would speak out, uh, I don't want to say against the industry, but in favor of the animal. And um, that led to an article written by Tim Zimmerman outside the magazine called Killer in the Pool that became the template for this movie. And the investigative group that was put together to help Tim write that article and for Gabriella to, to make the film continues today. And uh, we now meet every July in the San Juan Islands where I met uh, Rachel and, and Chris and their two fine young, young boys this summer. And that was uh, the genesis of this event. So thank you, Rachel and Chris. So 
I want to reiterate what Jeff said. Thank you guys very much for having us here. Um, I just was reminded once again how honored I am to be in this film and to be part of this movement with these two guys up here and everybody else who is in the film. Um, I've probably seen the film, it's got to be at least 50 times. So, and I, and I realized what an amazing movie Gabriella put together. Um, she just weaves a story that my experience, every time I'm in the audience and I'm able to just feel what, what the vibe is in the room, it just seems like um, the reaction to this film is always surprising to me. Uh, how people just get really involved in the story and it, and it makes them want to do something. There's something about watching this movie, and I've, I've actually had the opportunity to go all over the world with the movie um, over the past year and a half, and I've seen audiences everywhere have this reaction to the movie. It, it wakes people up in some ways, it opens their hearts, and it makes them want to participate in some level. I kind of consider it a gateway drug in some ways, because people who maybe were just focused on their own lives and not thinking outside their own individual box all of a sudden start thinking about, well, um, not just about killer whales, but then they think about, well, what's life like for the killer whales in our natural environment, and how about the state of the oceans, and what are we doing <coughs> to the planet, and on and on. And so it, it gets people involved, people who weren't, wouldn't necessarily consider themselves activists, but it makes people want to get up and do something to, um, to be a part of the solution. So I, I really appreciate that about the movie. But, um, and my story, how, I'm, how the reason I'm here, is that a lot of people have asked me uh, at what point during my SeaWorld career did I realize that there was something wrong with killer whales in captivity or dolphins in captivity in general? And I'm embarrassed to say that because of my training as an animal science major, I had this very scientific, utilitarian approach to working with animals. I felt kind of like they were there to do a job and I was there to do a job. And because I'd only worked with captive, domesticated animals um, in, as an undergrad, I felt like if you can give these animals the right veterinary care, and you give them love, and you give them the right food, then it doesn't really matter if they're they're in a, in a pool. And I felt like, you know, SeaWorld, if they had to be in a pool or in a tank, that SeaWorld was probably the, the best place in the industry they could possibly be, that, that SeaWorld was the, the top place in the world. And um, honestly, it wasn't until Dawn was killed in February of 2010 that I started to think maybe everything that I thought I knew about killer whales might be wrong. And it still took me another six months to, to come forward and speak in public. I read Tim Zimmerman's article that featured these two guys, um, and that was in July of 2010 that that came out, and that led me to joining a group of, uh, at the time the group was a Google group called Orca Aware, and it was comprised of journalists and scientists, people who I thought of as animal activists, former SeaWorld trainers, and we started having a discussion, and, and the more I found out, the more I realized that, you know, what I thought I knew about these animals um, wasn't, wasn't the truth at all, and that led me down the path of eventually feeling like I had some information that needed to get out there, and so I started reluctantly really speaking out in public, and that's where it started for me. Yeah, what they said. <laughs> um, it's, it's been, first of all, thank you very, very much for being here with us. It's uh, quite an honor to be in the room with all of you people and, and to be here. And it's been an amazing journey, and um, for me, it's one that began uh, almost uh, arm in arm, literally, with Jeff Ventry up here uh, working together at SeaWorld of Florida. And uh, I remember, uh, of course, Jeff and I immediately um, you know, kind of hooked up, and we became very good friends immediately. And and uh, I remember, you know, many kind of warm and fuzzy times uh, having a cold beer with with uh, with Jeffrey and uh, talking about some of these issues, right, that we were seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. So this conversation began, uh, I'd say roughly 1993 for, for the both of us. And, and at the time, we were both working there and we were powerless, and of course, you don't say these things in front of the wrong people, you, you can immediately. Um, and so this, is a, this is a, has been an, evolutionary, uh, an evolution for me, and I think probably for all of us. Um, and when I was working there, I, did, I spent an awful lot of time with Tilikum, as the, the film accurately portrays. Uh, and I remember many, many days going home and you know, just being uh, broken, um, you know, just being uh, completely broken about what I was seeing every day with the animals. And getting up the next morning and going to work and trying my best and going home at night and sometimes crying and sometimes just being really, really um, down uh, about the whole thing. And so it was emotionally very difficult for me I lasted uh, for a little longer than four years, and I knew that for my own mental health, I couldn't keep doing it. 
Um, and so I guess for, at, at some deep level for me, it's been cathartic to tell the truth. And, um, and uh, Dr. Ventry and I have just, kind of our approach has been very synergistic in the conversation. We've tried to take a scientific approach and we've tried to, to, to disclose the science of captivity. Uh, rather than, you know, being uh, banner waivers and talk about how sad they are, which is not very scientific, right? We're trying to kind of disclose the science to the public, and, uh, and I think we're having some success, and Blackfish has uh, moved this discussion uh, in leaps and bounds. And uh, the, the best thing about it is now we're like this tiny, insignificant cog in this huge movement, this global movement where all these terrific uh, young people, old people, everybody is uh, on board and everybody's doing their thing to get this ended and we're making real progress and that's been the, the cool thing now is we can kind of sit back in our lounge chair and watch it all unfold because all of you folks are now, uh, you know, taking the, the baton and running with it. So it's been an honor um, and it's been amazing and if uh, my life ends tomorrow, I could think that I would be happy knowing that we've made a, a bit of a stamp and change the trajectory of this discussion a little bit. I just want to add one more thing, and I won't reveal how many hundreds of hours we both spent writing and John working. When he, when he says laying back in his lounge chair, that's John's sarcasm coming up. We're all working very hard at this every day. In fact, uh, John's making a, what, a third revision on our latest uh, peer-reviewed piece that's going to be coming out in a major journal both in, in a couple months. So we're still working very hard behind the scenes. So I, I guess now we're happy to take questions, um, comments, concerns, throwing tomatoes at us, whatever works for you. Um, and we'll stay here as long as they leave the lights on. We, we don't know how to stand. basically alone in this and it was very scary and I have a wife and child and and, um, and I told my wife this is what I think we need to do uh, Marla is that we, we need to tell the truth and Marla said you can't do that because SeaWorld is going to come after you or us meaning her too and they're going to drain our checking account and um, and you know <laughs> It was a diff- difficult decision to, to basically lay it all out and say, I have no choice in this, I have to do it. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I'm still looking over my shoulder. Um, you know, I live in Florida an hour from the SeaWorld Park. I teach at a university at an hour from the SeaWorld Park. And I keep wondering when SeaWorld's going to make a magic donation to the university of $30 million, you know, with the... Uh, with the stipulation that one jerk gets let go, right? So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always uh, still very concerned that Sea World is going to do something. Uh, but so far, they really haven't done anything too, I'd say, overly uh, aggressive with me. The reason for that is, is quite simple. Sea World uh, made a, a, a calculation, and that was they underestimated what Blackfish would do. So instead of giving us any type of attention in the form of a lawsuit, they decided for the first about a year to ignore what it was that we were doing. And then uh, I think that the turning point was when Blackfish uh, played on in October of last year, to, you know, on its first viewing on CNN, 21 million people, and then it kind of it shifted gears and then started the personal attacks. I think one thing that's important to note, though, you probably you probably noticed that. The three of us up here worked at SeaWorld in the late 80s and also early 90s, and there aren't, there still are not that many people who have recently quit the company coming forward. There's two people in the movie who are speaking who are, you know, more recent employees of the company, but there's people who have quit in the past four years who have not come forward. And one of the things that's different is that none of us up here signed a non-disclosure agreement. So that's one thing, you know, not, not that that means anything, but, um, but SeaWorld does have some legal recourse to come after people who sign a non-disclosure agreement. So that's one thing that, that puts you a little bit more at risk. 
Um, all of the, uh, the four of us in Voice of the Orcas have our own careers. We've been out of the industry. We're not trying to get back into the industry on any level. Most people don't know if you haven't worked for a company like SeaWorld, but it's very much like a cult. Uh, there are only, you know, maybe 300, 400 people who train killer whales in the world. There's not a lot of positions for training killer whales or even training dolphins. So if you want to stay in the industry, if you want to be working with cetaceans, then you're not really going to come forward and open, and open up your mouth and say, well, I've seen this, I've seen that, I know what goes on behind the scenes. It's been very hard. Uh, just recently, Tim Zimmerman came out with an article series where he featured some animal care workers who, because they were working even more behind the scenes than us, saw some really horrific things going on with the animals that I didn't even know about when I was at the park. And uh, I know um, several of those people who spoke are still conflicted about coming forward and they, they still feel uncomfortable. There's a sense internally, I know even after, so Dawn was killed in 2010, that was 17 years after I left the park. And I still felt, even though I wasn't going back in the industry, I still had friends, you know, friends on Facebook, I felt like it was a betrayal to speak out. It was very, that first time I went on, on Fox News, I still remember the feeling of, I, I was on TV at 4.30 in the morning, Alaska time, and I left the TV studio at 6.30 in the morning, and I was really expecting the SeaWorld band to pull up, the black and white band to come up and whisk me away. It just, it felt really wrong to be speaking out, and I think that's just the culture that's created in that particular company. There are other companies that are much more forward thinking, but when you work for a place like that, it's, it's very much understood that it is not okay to talk about what you see and that there will be repercussions. And I think that it's interesting that for all of us, you know, 15, 20 years later, it was still difficult, even though we, our livelihood wasn't necessarily attached to it.